Mm, should we review some albums? Yes, let's do it. Here we go. It's going to be long, so sit tight. <laughs> or just skip if you want. That's the start. Strap yourselves in. Mm. Facts. <laughs> Lists of facts. Uh, yeah. Rod the Lightning. A peace of mind. Controversial. They're fighting to the death. I might need to cut that out because the, the, the microphone, if I have to sort of do it away from the microphone. There we go. Uh, yeah, exponential jumping quality. It did occur to me only today. That means it's less interesting to talk about because this is, these are metal albums that sound like heavy metal. At least last week, that no one knew good albums, but you, 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 you're in proto stages. And that's yeah. more interesting yeah. to talk about. Not to listen to, but to talk about. Um, but yeah. Two awesome albums, regardless of the comparison. I said it's pointless and it's unfair comparing them, but I think what this does with these two albums is it, 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 you'll give a, a false impression by comparing them to each other. Suddenly I'm going to be saying about this being a sort of teenagers and it's... And uh, this is prog now. <laughs> but, uh, whereas actually, if we were reviewing them in, in isolation, we wouldn't say either of those things. You know. Both fantastic albums. One's got much more going on. But ultimately, what, what I'm going to talk about, and what everyone I'm sure now is thinking, is what? Why aren't you doing Number of the Beast? And have we done Number of the Beast? I'm not sure how that will go. Either equal or maybe. I don't know. I don't, I'm not really sure. One of, the, one of them only has two members of the band left from the album we previously did. You know, it's his fourth album. And it has an extra benefit. With each new member that changed, it's a new thing. Like, you know, and they've got, they've got firepower. And it, it means it's all very inspired. And that's not something you expect me to say about my band. Because because they've got a prog drummer, not because they've got an singer. It's when they got Nico McBrain that happened, not when they got Bruce. That suddenly it's really exciting. You know, there's all sorts of things going on, and it's it's oh man, and it's, you can hear the the inspiration. You know, and it doesn't matter that that's it. You know, and then they just make more albums the same. Forget you don't you know you don't you, you don't have to think about that. You just think about this album at that point. That's what people say first four. You know. That's the destination. Now they've made 15, 16 albums, I don't know how many. Probably more than that. Uh, that doesn't, in a way, it doesn't mean anything anymore. If you heard all that stuff first and then heard this, you'd be like, oh, it's just all right, man. But you have to take it in that, that thing. There's four albums, and this is the oh, destination, you know. This has the same lineup. And yet, a huge leap, an exponential leap in awesomeness, you know, after like a year. It's amazing. How did that happen? And we'll talk about that as well. How did how, how did that happen? Because <laughs> it's really good. Uh, both of the albums have obviously positioned filler tracks, and the way they are on the album shows that they know their filler tracks as well. But yeah, good and good. Okay, well, I don't want to. You know, we'll go over some of the same ground as we did last week. I I, I imagine. Mm. I mean, this is how I imagine Iron Maiden to sound. And if this is the destination... Uh. <laughs> <laughs> but there's only one album of it, it's great. It? Okay, maybe if there's one album of it, it's maybe it's great, it's I don't know. But I've, uh, so. I've become I've become tired. You know, it's a sort of... Yeah, that, that warbly voice is there, as you say. <laughs> I find a complete turn off. It's almost as if, you know, 15 seconds in, I felt, I've heard this now. I don't need to hear any more of this. Yeah, literally, yeah. 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 That's, <laughs> well, actually, that's that, the Queen thing, isn't it? Was it mm. Seven Seas of Roy? They tried the kitchen sink in the first few seconds, and that's literally what happened. <laughs> um, which uh, it's, it, it's, it's not a good thing as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, well, if you think, wow, that's all good, is there more of that? That's good. But if you yeah. think, well... Mm. <laughs> which is where I was at. Now, Metallica, Ride the Lightning, is interesting because this was actually my first Metallica album. Oh, my God. In fact, I think this album was my introduction to rock. It's quite, Goodness quite me. a big thing, yeah? Yeah. And it, and it dawned on me as I was listening to this, I haven't listened to this for fudding years. Mm. And I was, I, was trying to th- I was trying to think why. And I think the reason is, is because I didn't actually like it that much. I had... Two albums off the bat, it was Ride the Lightning and Master of Puppets. Right. Yeah. Mm. And I was really into Master of Puppets. And I was, this was sort of like, okay, I'll listen, I've listened to Master of Puppets about 15 times. Uh, I'll listen to this now. Mm. What there is on this song is good songs. Yes. There are some good songs on here. Yeah. 
good Metallica songs. Yeah. yeah. There it is. It's there now. It's basically yeah, which is um, which is exciting, you know. But it's still very. It's still both of these albums are very much in the vein of of, of metal that I'm not really into. Fast and tinny, yeah. That's, still that's sounds tinny. It's incredibly yeah. trouble. Yeah. Um, I don't know why they did it. I mean, you would have thought, you know, we're big angry people. Let's have bass. I know, yeah, and then they got yeah. It all went really tinny for some reason. I, mean, um, I have to say about that one. They got they lost their equipment. They had their equipment stolen, and and James Hetfield obviously was really sensitive about this, and they got every amp in the whole of Copenhagen because they've got it in Copenhagen to try and get right. And he's messing with him, trying to get the sound. He's got a guitar sound he likes. It's a much better guitar sound, <laughs> but it's only the guitars. You can almost only hear the guitars. And everything yeah. else is in the background. It's a fantastic, fantastic guitar sound. Nothing else. Yeah. So yeah, that's where I'm at really. I mean, this is Iron Maiden. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like Iron Maiden. And it sounds like Iron Maiden. This is Metallica, and it sounds like Metallica with, with good songs. Surely there's only one winner in this battle. The fight. Yes, it's a piece of mind. <laughs> oh, by the way, if you're gonna search for that on Spotify, it's peace of mind, P-I-E-C-E, -E, not P-E-A-C-E, because it's yeah. a little while it's to a piece find of it. Mind. It's, yeah. Talk about that. Yeah, that's probably the most interesting thing I'm going to say about this album. <laughs> but that's, that's the thing with Number of the Beast, all the stuff that happened with Number of the Beast, all the nonsense they got from America. It's from America, isn't it? It was Americans who, the most, it's so ridiculous that they think, oh, they're Satanists. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's got like dripping blood text on the screen, on the, on the, the album cover. So that's what that's about. Peace of mind. Having a lot to be, they're all a bit thick, really, aren't they? It's just stupid. <laughs> That's, yeah, that's, it's, it's a funny concert, it's a good concert. And no, there was light, and we talked about Number of the Beast. <laughs> uh, yeah, so controversial, everyone's going to say, it's the first thing people will say, well, then the Number of the Beast. Um, for, number of the Beast was the first time they had to write an album from scratch. A lot of it, it's, it's a very commercial album. You could almost call it the sellout album, if it wasn't the fact that it's the same. <laughs> that's everything they've done. You've got classics, you've got Rose of the Hills, another Charlotte Harlot song, 22 Glacier Avenue, Number of the Beast, Children of the Damned. The song about the prisoner. How cool is that? But the actual song is incredibly bland, poppy. Bland, bland, yeah, bland, yeah. And but the um, the best bit of it, of course, is the recording of the prisoner going, "You are number six and all that. You know, it's like, yeah. And it does have "Hallowed Be Thy Name," which is probably, I think, I made the best song. But for me, that really is far ahead of the rest of the album. And that still has two further tracks. Interestingly. Um, Famously, they chose the wrong B-side. They put Total Eclipse as the B-side to run to the hills. It was all very time, you know, they were doing everything too quickly. And, and uh, so they ended up using the super meh, uh, Adrian Smith and Todd Burr's song, Gang Home, which was a mistake. Steve Harris has subsequently said they chose the wrong song. And I think maybe that's why on here they chose, they just put everything on there. There's nine tracks. So rather than expanding to Tamer Land, you've got Quest for Fire and Sun of Steel, which are, which are really, really b side -y. It's got to be said, you know. But yeah, you know, uh, bear in mind, Steve Harris agrees with me about this. So, you know, more controversy next week. <laughs> I'm just wondering, Kev, have I become jaded? Is that is that the problem here? It's, 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 it's the effect of prog, isn't it? Everything just sounds, if it's not prog, because it's just, it's just normal. There's nothing weird. There's 4-4, four, four, and it's... Actually, well, not everything on there is 4-4, four, four, actually. It's the guitar that's, that's banal on, on peace of mind. Actually, if you listen to the drums, there's all sorts of stuff going you know, and melodically, it's, it's all sorts of things, you know. It's just because it sounds just like, like Iron Maiden, and that's Iron Maiden. Yeah. And it's the middle of a trilogy. You know, it's the second album, it's The Empire Strikes Back, which is a really good analogy, actually. Aha, yeah, next week. It is the most probably of those three albums. It's the best one, it's got the most going on, you know. And, you know, Iron Maiden are not known for being very tight. Certainly later, uh, tight but loose, is, the, is an accurate description, you know? But here it's very tight because they've just got a prog drummer and it's like, oh, wow, we can do this, we can do this, right, you know? And their focus and their, their driven and all that stuff makes everything very tight and they're not going to be like that. Whereas Ride the Lightning is a masterpiece in spite of everything, <laughs> you know? Whereas Peace of Mind is, is like, they've, they, they've planned everything from the start and they've got their perfect. Ride the Lightning, you think, how did they make that? <laughs> you know? They had songs like Phantom Lord, a song called Phantom Lord, the EP, you know, before Kill 'Em All was called No Life Dull Leather, and the name of the band is rubbish, Metallica, right? 
they nicked the name of the band. Lars nicked it from his mate who was looking for names of fanzines. And it's such a crappy name because he wanted to call the band Thunderfuck. That's great. I like mm. that. Mm. You know, uh, he's the cultured one. <laughs> you, know, you know, they've got singer with this sort of repressed hard man act going on. You've got, oh, oh yeah, the, 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 remember last week we said about the album cover was a bit stupid and, and it turns out they didn't choose the album cover. They wanted a hand coming out of a toilet holding a knife. Oh, that and was it. Yeah, they wanted to call the album Metal Up Your Ass. <laughs> um, That's funny, isn't it? It is funny, but, I mean, for, you know, it's just, oh, these, how do, it's just like Sabbath. How did they do this? <laughs> and it's amazing. It's like the best metal ever. And I think it's such a stereotype. It's Cliff, isn't it? Cliff is key. We didn't say this last week. And I, I think that's meaningful because actually, although there's a bass solo on there, the Cliff influence isn't in the songs. It's, mm-hmm. That's just Motorhead fast. You know, I think they said, you know, Judas, Judas Priest music played as fast as Motorhead. And that's exactly what it is. The intro to From Whom the Bell Tolls was actually in his previous band. He actually put that bit in and that's like, Probably the best bit on any Metallica album, I think. Uh, but he, you know, he had actual music theory. He actually knew about notes and things. You remember James and Lars are the songwriters, but Cliff has got credit. And I think he's saying, yeah, just move this note down, makes it diminished. And things like that. So you get a little bit of neoclassical metalness in there. I was going to say there's none of that on peace of mind. And then the other day I was, I was humming... And I thought, oh, I don't know, that's... Oh, it's, oh, it's still life. So yeah, the, the, there's, the after, there is loads going on in Peace of Mind. It's easy to forget because it just sounds like I'm a <laughs> Actually, there's more going on there than the, on most brain albums. And Cliff is from the 70s. Yeah, he, he, he wore flares. Yeah. yeah. In 1993 to wear flares, he's like, that's, that, that's rebellion. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the year of, of, of Michael Jackson. The, you know, the rest of them have got peroxide hair and all that stuff. You know, and I'm Maiden, I think, as well, I've always said this, that they're from the 70s. I mean, actually, they are from, technically, literally from the 70s, but that's why they were so successful. It was 70s music in the 80s. So it had to become more homogenised, a lot more homogenised. <laughs> but that's why everyone loved them so much. When everything's, it has to be incredibly pigeonholed or incredibly bland or, or it's, it's all about images, etc., etc. You've got my maiden doing their thing, and that's, that's why people love them so much. It was just songs. Cliff wasn't a Maiden fan, though, interestingly. He wasn't even a No Woman fan at all. He didn't think any much of that at all. He had, he not only was he the Mojo guy, he was the musical one. And he was in charge of music on the tour bus for Kill Em All. And I think it's massively significant that he made them listen to, yes, Peter Gabriel, The Police, you know, and it was the new albums, it was the new stuff. He was making them listen to this stuff. And whereas, wasn't, there, was it, wasn't there a thing this week that um, Lars Ulrich said he's a big fan of Marillion? Yes. It's interesting, isn't it? I don't think that would have happened without Cliff. Because... And it's interesting that this is the broad one, which is ridiculous because it's not broad at all. <laughs> but and it's Maiden who were the zealous ones who sacked the guitarist because he was listening to the Eagles. Whereas Cliff is making them listen to the Eagles. <laughs> and they're thinking, oh, this is good. You know, uh, 9025, break this and that. Wow, this is good. That's good. And then they go and record this album. That's, that's what it is. That, and, 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 you know, what people say now is that, well, it's not true to flat thrash. There's, an, there's acoustic guitar on it. You know, the thrash fans are like, oh, and that's why it's just fantastic. You know, it's the, it's the cliff influence on there. But also, you know, imagine James Hitfield responding to Time and a Word. There's a word and the word is love and it's right for me. And the word is love. Imagine James Hitfield sitting there <laughs> having to listen to that, you know, because what a, what a tit. <laughs> The hard man act thing. But actually, the guy had this terrible childhood. So I can't relate to that. So you can't really judge him, can you? He lost both. His dad disappeared and then his mum died. And I mean, for God's sake, you know. And even in the band, it's not like they grew up together. He didn't have a soulmate in the band. We said it was like Sabbath, but Sabbath did grow up together. I mean, whether Tony Obi hated Dozzy or whatever. You know, and Lars, who is, you know, his, his, his long term friend, he's from a different country. And, and, and James Hetfield says when, when they had McDonald's he had herring <laughs> <laughs> it was just a cultural thing that was you know mm, a bit of herring and he had Dave Mustaine at the start you know and, and he's from Broken Home as well so the, 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 they're very similar people actually they're both kind of arseholes or seen as being like that um, the difference is Mustaine had all the ego he did talk to the audience and swearing at the audience and all that stuff and so rather than a soulmate he found an evil twin 
and that was that, that was part of the problem, you know. And you can't really have three band leaders either. So really, although you could argue Dave Mustaine at the start, and I don't think Cliff at that early on. Dave Mustaine was was the talent. He wrote the songs, and without him, there'd be no killing them, you know. He had to go in order for James Hetfield to come out as his thing, and that, I think that's on Fade to Black. You know, he wouldn't have been able to do that still with Dave Mustaine in the band, just swearing and pouring beer in people's instruments and whatever he was doing, you know. So yeah, James Hetfield is an incredibly talented person. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's a revelation. It is a revelation. Because <laughs> this is really dumb. Um, the drumming, there is a thing actually, you know, uh, there's m- moments where something's happening with the guitar that's quite interesting and there's just book, book in the background and it's like... It's not the technique. He just doesn't know what to do because he's not a drummer, you know. So it is there even on these albums. And I've said in the past, I've said there's nothing wrong with the, the drumming on these albums. And to be fair, on, only by listening to it with that critical eye did I notice what's he doing. <laughs> <laughs> so it, basically, their mojo is so high they transcend it. It doesn't matter, you know. He just isn't a drummer, and he, he admits himself that five minutes after getting a drum kit, he's in a band. <laughs> and then they're, they're world famous. Oh, shit. And he had to have drum lessons because I can't play it. <laughs> so fair enough, you know. Anything else you want to say about Word of the Lightning? No, just, uh, you know. It's good. It's good. It's a good album. It's a good album, yeah. you know. And So peace of mind, it's, it's, that's so interesting that this is something that's been, you know, they've they planned their lives years in advance, the world, world domination. But that's, that's where they got to. And some people will be sitting at home thinking, oh, no, it isn't, it's the next one. That's where they got to. That's what some people say the first four. You know, they had a new band member on each successive album. Uh, so Adrian Smith replaced Dennis Stratton because Dennis wasn't pure enough. And it's really not a huge change on the guitar, is it? It's, it it sounds the same. <laughs> it does sound. And I don't think, ah, oh, well, you're not a guitarist, you don't know. You know, we just done the Dixie Drakes. You know what Steve Moore sounds like. He doesn't sound like Kirk Hammett, does he? You know, the, the, it's different. <laughs> you know, and then we did, uh, yes. Steve Howe, you recognise Steve Howe, he sounds different. Guitarists can sound different, or at least they did in the 70s, but not in the 80s. Actually, I noticed, I thought I was going to say how the, the guitar work on here is much more hard-edged. It's the same. The guitar solos are the same. It's even the same licks. <laughs> it's just the same. And actually, the Mustaine thing is, 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 is gone now. And, that, and you know, from, from Kirk Hammett's point of view, he's been more melodic, because he likes Iron Maiden. But what that means is... This is the same. But I mean, particularly, you say that the solo on Fight to Black, if you told me that was Dave Murray, I could believe it. I could almost believe it. <laughs> you know, because that's, that's how the old guitarist sounded. Controversial. Uh, and that's the thing, I'm not a Kirk Hammett fan and all that, and, and yet really. <laughs> it's, you know, the, the post Hendrix era. That's what most people sounded like. And obviously, Kirk was taught by Joe Satriani. And Joe Satriani sounds like Joe Satriani, obviously, but Kirk. Isn't Joe Satriani? They also got Martin Birch on the second album, of course, um, and that made a big difference in the sound. And it's what Martin Birch does is it's all about the clarity and it's all about the sort of purest version of the song. If you want an intense version, listen to the live version. But the the, the clarity on his production is great. And this is slightly muddier than the next one, actually. I think that they had to record Capone Point Studios in wherever it is, Bahamas. They just wanted to go to the Bahamas, you know. Um, and he wanted someone better, so maybe that's why the next one sounds better. Maybe I don't know. So in his third album, of course, they got a new singer. It, you know, it's Ian Gillan meets Peter Hamill meets Arthur Brown. It really is. That's you know, and you think, wow, it's not like a compromise between the three. It's a bit of that, and a bit of that, a bit of that. It's like you add them together <laughs> more, and the volume increases with each one. So there's, there's none of the subtlety and the sort of richness of his voice later on. It's it's, uh, and he doesn't actually have good technique. You know, he's just sort of pure. Dexterity or lungs or whatever, you can just go, Arr! which became a problem, which we'll talk about, I think. Completely over the top. It is completely over the top. It's someone who loves all this 70s stuff and he wants to do that. Yeah, and he's got infinite energy. You know, and he got called the air raid siren, which wasn't, wasn't, you know, it wasn't a compliment. It was, it was someone criticising it. We've got this blokey Londoner guy going, you know, uh, just 16. So, so this. But that became his thing, and they called him the Aero Siren. I thought, that's good, yeah, we'll go with that. And, you know, you have to remember, Steve would write the melody, and he wouldn't be thinking, oh, that's the singer's range there. 
He whistles the melody, and you have to sing it. <laughs> go on. And he has to go, ah, ah. you know, and you can't, no, no, you can't use falsetto. No, no, full head voice. <laughs> and of course, he can do it. Or at this point, he can do it. Anyway, the, the, the touring went on, of course, that became impossible to keep doing it. It's like his lozenges with him. And it gets more ridiculous through the 80s, actually, where the, thing, the songs are just so impossible to sing. <laughs> How the bloody hell is he singing that? But, as I said, you know, it's not about Bruce. It's about Nico, Nico McBrain. Clive Burr couldn't hack it with touring all that, famously throwing up into a bucket while he's playing, probably from partying and etc. and that affected his show, so they had to get rid of him. Um, so they just got a prog drummer. He's good, let's have him. Because they toured with um, this, this French prog band called Trust, who apparently were very political, but... Um, Nico is like this Londoner guy, he didn't know what they were singing about, he didn't speak French. <laughs> but he's an incredibly capable drummer, who, you know, he's a proper prog drummer. And that opens things up massively. And I think, so at this point, you know, they're trying things, all about this, let's try this. Could he just play along with that like that? Oh my God. And I think they're so later on, and I, I, maybe, you know, part of Bruce's later frustration was about the fact that they had this firepower there, but they're not using it, they're just making more Iron Maiden albums. <laughs> you know, maybe. Um, of course, where Eagles Dare, the famous, not a dual bass drum, he's going. Which is amazing, it really is amazing. You know, it's, it's easy to sort of hear it in the background as that sounds like where Eagles Dare, it sounds like a heavy metal song. If you actually listen to what he's doing on drumming, it is, it is stunning. You know, he's introducing himself, they're, they're playing, they're playing around, they're trying things, it's, it's so much more exciting. You know, we've got a bit of everything. You know, you've got, yeah, like I said, the, the obligatory. Well, what would become the obligatory, of course, it's the first time they did it. The heroic World War Two song or whatever. Showing off their new toy, basically. No little bass drum. You've got the Bruce Penned, him inspired epic melodic thing. You've got the controversial now, but you've got the, the uh, Bruce and Adrian Smith commercial single. You know, the two of them could write singles together in a way Steve wouldn't do that because he wouldn't write that commercial. But that helped tremendously with, with marketing and stuff like that. And, and the single sold, you know. And the fact that it's a bit slower uh, is really controversial. You know, the, 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 the Steve and, and Nico wanted to play it faster. It's a rock song, you know, but no, no, you keep it slow. And it served its purpose. You know, those songs serve their purpose. It's not bad songs, they're really good songs. But it also what it means is you've got a bit of variation on this, because that's like a much more commercial single. At least you've got some variation on it. It isn't just another Maiden song, another Maiden song, another Maiden song. We've got, oh yeah, the classic Maiden Thundering Bass song. For some people, the ultimate classic Maiden Thundering Bass song, The Trooper, you know, impossible vocals. You've got a strangely off-kilter, what should be a straight rock song, W Boot song, should be a, strain, a straight rock song, but there's just something weird about it. I like that. I like songs that are like that, where it's just a bit off-kilter, a bit like um, Pictures of Home. There's just something weird, it's not quite normal. And, you know, it's a really strange song that they were writing like that. It's brilliant. We Have Still Life, which I think is one of the best Iron Maiden songs. And it's weird how, you know, this whole album is kind of overlooked and kind of forgotten. But that song, I think, is one of their best songs. And it's not talked about, they barely play it. I think they played it on the, the Seven Sun tour. I don't think they've played it since, as far as I know. Even, even when they went back and did the first four albums tour in 2005, I don't think they played it. As far as I know, it's really strange. I think I'd, I'd put that it's up there with Mariner and, and, and whatever, you know. Oh, we've got the classic Harris epic, of course. It's about Dune, but they weren't allowed to call it Dune because what's his name, Frank Herbert, uh, doesn't like heavy metal bands. <laughs> so they just called it for Tamer Land and just released it anyway. Maybe that's why. I mean, to me, I would have said, well, expand to Tamer Land and get rid of Quest of Fire and Sun still. Because they're, they're very, very meh songs, and you've got too many songs as well. Um, but maybe that was one, maybe they were a bit disheartened by the fact they couldn't call it Dune. And actually, that epic the thing about T To Tame Land is not only has it been forgotten, I don't think it's been played since that tour, they didn't even play it for the whole tour. Um, it doesn't sound the same as all the others. Wow! <laughs> it's the only main epic that actually sounds different. Um, the usual lyric stuff we've got uh, Child of the Light Brigade, Dune. Bruce doing his G.K. Chesterton and Crowley. Uh, Still Life is from some, some, from some short story. You've got the movies, Where Eagles Dare, and the spectacularly met Join My Quest for Fair. Um, Flight of Icarus. It's an awful lot like Icarus Born of Wings of Steel by Kansas. It's not the same, it's just much the same. <laughs> you know, 
Can't be a coincidence. That must, that's, that's Bruce, I think, thinking, well, who just did a bit of that? Because that, 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 that's what Kansas were, wasn't it? The commercial. Southern Steel, again, really boring song, but the lyrics, I mean, it's about this ancient samurai guy from the 1500s. Is that ancient? Is 1500s ancient? Ancient enough. Yeah, ancient enough. I thought it was this guy, he was samurai, who tried to overthrow the other, uh, inspire a, a rebellion and overthrow, overthrow the government. But he failed, so he stabbed himself. I thought that was that guy, but I read up on it. He isn't, it's not that guy at all. It's just this sort of super samurai guy, something, something. Obviously, it's, simple, it's but it's the sword thing, isn't it? It's Bruce's sword thing, I suppose. And, uh, and what's interesting, I said this, how much they've converged now. You know, there's much less difference. The, the, the previous two albums, there was no similarity at all. It was different. But now, there's much more of a thing. Um, partially, I think Kirk, maybe, is, is the Maiden influence. There's a lot of stuff that sounds like Maiden on there. You've got the harmonies, obviously. And now, the lyrics, rather than just being... Um, is now... You know, the title is from the stand. You've got Cthulhu spelt wrong. I wonder if maybe... I've said Cthulhu all these years, and it's actually Cthulhu. So I can't really slag off Metallica for spelling it wrong because they've taught me how to pronounce it. Maybe it's Cthulhu, not Cthulhu. Mm. Mm. And you've got the predictable Hetfield stuff on there as well, which is great. In Maiden, people write songs. People come in with songs and they construct riffs around it. In Metallica, they jam riffs, stick the riffs together and make a song. So it's interesting how it's a different way around. And the producer asks Lars, does, there, does every song start with an upbeat? Every song on the album? And he said, what's an upbeat? <laughs> We <laughs> had to tell him about beats. Yeah, you had these beats that, that came, that <laughs> which is really, you know. Um, but L- Lars admits himself, like he said, you know, he just started the drums and then he's in the band and he's, it's too late. I know. And it's a bit like Tommy Bowling when he joined Deep Purple and, and they had this amazing jam. It's like, oh my god, this is amazing. Yeah, you've got to join the band. Let him in the band without checking things first. <laughs> and then they say, okay, okay, we're going to play Burn now. And you, you start after two bars, okay, I'm going to come in. What's a bar? <laughs> oh, shit. Because Tommy Bowen, you know, one day we'll probably do a Spectrum, which is Billy Cobham's solo album, first solo album after uh, a Vishnu. It's a fantastic guitar playing on that. You know. And Joe Satriani himself says, it doesn't matter if James Hetfield knows that this is diminished and blah, blah, blah. It sounds really good. They've got mojo at this point, and it's brilliant. I think the Copenhagen thing is significant because I don't hear the LA ness in there. It's a much more transatlantic album. Kill Em All for me is, 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 is an American sounding album, you know, whereas this isn't. This is, this is Thunderbirds. It's uh, Atlantis something. Oh yeah, be- okay, best songs. Best songs, I think it's really, it's like, there's a huge leaps in quality in the, in the album. I mean, For Whom the Bell Tolls and Fate of Black for me are six, eight songs, you know, but then you've got uh, Escape, and Trapped Under Ice, which could have been on Kill Em All. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if you agree with that, but to me there's this, this huge leap in quality. It's like, and on a, on, a, on a metallic compilation, I would put those two songs. I mean, to me, I, I think Trapped 5, 6 and 7 are filler. But Creeping Death is a classic bit of Metallica. It's like a famous song that they always play and they all love, so... I don't know. And Call of Cthulhu, you've still got a lot of stuff written by um, Damon Stone at this point. But I really like Call of Cthulhu. I love the fact that it's instrumental. So you're just listening to the, the, you know, well, you can only hear the guitars pretty much. <laughs> and I'll sit and listen, oh, I've heard this. What does this sound like? This is ripped off of something, something from the 70s. They had just nicked it. And I realised actually, no, 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 it's, it sounds like Dream Theater. <laughs> In other words, Dream Theater based, the, basically, it's Call of Cthulhu meets Close to the Edge. You have Dream Theater. <laughs> That's just nicked from there, which is, of course, it's written by like, Dave Mustaine. Dave Mustaine wrote Dream Theater. You don't have to be amazing musicians to come up with that, it turns out. You know, fade to black. It's uh, it's Freebird. Who's that? It, the structure is exactly Freebird. <laughs> it's like their evil Freebird. I wonder. I'm fade to black. It might be one of their best songs. It might be their best song. Maybe you know their best song, Kev. Could maybe. I mean, we've got to do the next two albums. Yeah. So I don't know yet. You have to remember, I I I know the next two really really well. Well, the next three really really well, unfortunately. Uh, and the first two I didn't know. I couldn't remember that well. And I was expecting this to be some sort of halfway between Master of Puppets and Kill em All, which and Kill em All was kind of... Yeah. It's not at all. This is I always almost saw, as good as the next one. Yeah, I, I always saw these as a pair, actually. Ride Lightning and Master of Puppets. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. Two of a pair. Two of a perfect pair. They've got yeah. one, two, three, because it's too complicated. 
Uh, best songs on Peace of Mind, still live for me, is absolute masterpiece. I love Tatanaland. The Trooper is the maiden one where they always play it. But that is the only song on there that they always play. It's weird how it's overlooked. It's the forgotten album. But Steve Harris agrees. You know, Steve Harris says he, he wasn't happy with the first album because of the production. So he likes Killers, he likes this, he likes Seventh Son, and he likes X Factor. And I would imagine a matter of life and death, which I've never heard, actually, I haven't heard that yet. I'm catching up with Maiden. Um, they release albums too fast for me. Because <laughs> obviously I only want to buy them if I'm really in the mood, and it's all the same, you know. So I've only got as far as Dance of Death, interestingly. That was quite, that was quite a few years, that was about three years ago I got Dance of Death, actually, so I need to, <laughs> to get a matter of life and death next. I'm still not sort of... Um... I mean, I was kind of hoping that this would be significantly better than the last one. And I think you think it is. Yeah. I still see it as l- largely pointless. Is it? I mean, is it because the, the, it's like... Oh, I'm trying to think of an analogy where... I can't imagine. I'll tell you what it is. I mean, music either tends to sort of augment our life or it sort of changes our sort of outlook on life, yeah? Mm-hmm. So I can't imagine what state of mind I'd have to be in for that to make sense. <laughs> okay? It's just there. It's just, it's my maintenance there. Yeah. I mean, this is quite exciting, yeah? You can listen to that and get a bit of, whoa, going on. I just don't... I've, I've never got it with the Iron Maiden. It just seems... What am I doing, you know? What, why Why am I listening to this? <laughs> What's the you know? point of listening to it? I, just, I know what that sounds like, and I'm hearing it again. <laughs> is it... Is that the problem? Is... is because it, you've heard Iron Maiden before. I haven't heard Iron Maiden that much, to be honest. I've never really sort of okay. gone for it. My exposure to Iron Maiden has come from you, yeah? What? Uh, and maybe, actually, you remember we watched the film, that film? Is it My Chemical Wedding? Or? Oh, Chemical Wedding. Chemical Wedding. Bruce's Wedding. film. Yeah. Bruce's film. I think I got an incredibly negative... <laughs> um, terrible terrible movie. <laughs> <laughs> ...attitude towards... That was an interesting story, because for years he was trying to make a biopic made of Dallas to Crowley, and there wasn't enough money, so he had to make this ridiculous... He paid for it himself, and it's got Simon, Simon Cowell in it. Is it? A proper actor. Yeah, I think he plays Dallas to Crowley. Didn't mean Simon Cowell. Um, Not Simon Cowell. Um... <laughs> Not Simon Cowell. Yeah, yeah, what's his face? And produced by um, Python guy, whose name escapes me. The guy that did Python, whoever that was. But they just didn't have enough money, so they had to make some crappy. It was terrible. just. It was like a really bad episode of Doctor Who. Yeah, yeah. But obviously, you can see there, there just there was just about enough money to make a, t- a half hour TV episode, <laughs> and they made a film. Yeah, <laughs> and I, th- I think I got from that a very sort of. I think I got, I formed a an idea of Bruce Dickinson from that film, mm. and I was just oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> but you have to remember, Bruce is just a hired. I know, Lungs. I know, I know. Really? On this, he's writing a bit, but it's not, it's not him. It's not his band. Yeah. Yeah. But you, we saw some live stuff as well, and he came out, ooh, screaming down his bloody yeah. microphone. And I'm like, flip it. <laughs> I couldn't even tell the difference between the songs. It was just like another song now. Another song, but it's the same. Everyone's jumping around, really happy, yeah. and the set's looking really quite colourful. <laughs> um, I'm not wearing the t-shirt. <laughs> And I thought maybe we wouldn't actually look into them, you know, look into Iron Maiden. I'd, I'd find out what it was all about sneakily. But I, this is, I'm not there yet. I haven't... It hasn't clicked what what state of mind you have to be into to enjoy this. I don't know. Either, it either has to augment your state of mind or it has to sort of change it to something. It's not going to change it to anything else. Because it's... Mm. Or well, maybe you do need to hear Iron Maiden and hear how boring the other stuff is. And, and, <laughs> <laughs> well, this one, it's going... Oh, <laughs> uh, maybe I don't know maybe that's what it is maybe. so I, I, I hear I see the difference massively from all the albums that are the same I hear this huge difference that's uh-huh. not there and yeah and see we talk about this and, and obviously Ride the Lightning is even more homogenised but metal has so much in common with prog um, it's acultural you know it's a fashionable you've had people people hate hate it people in the industry try and stop it because <laughs> they're so angry about it that it's not their thing you know and it travels everywhere Everywhere in the world, completely global because of that. In a way, I mean, I think, is it what's it called? Um, metal for nations or music for nations? Is is that is that something to do with music for nations? Um, the idea was that you know, because punk, punk isn't going to travel, and in the same way, you know, Paul Diano just by going on a European tour, it was like this this London blokey act in like Greece. <laughs> what the hell is he talking about? <laughs> They're not going to understand it, you know. But it's 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 global. 
and that, that's, that's appealing for me that it's, it's not cultural it's just about the music man and that makes it like prog and those two bands are the vanguards of that yeah. you know, it's Metallica and Iron Maiden are the, the metal and it's not it, it much more than Sabbath because Sabbath are very grubby yeah, but the thing well, is, so anyway, yeah. I mean, Sabbath are just bloody excellent, aren't they? Um, yeah, and obviously <laughs> Sabbath do chat on everything, but yeah. I don't think as much because Ozzy, you know, and uh, uh, it seems to us, it's just this guy from Master. <laughs> he's been very drunk. And then they write these amazing songs. Yeah, it's <laughs> well, that good? brilliant album. Oh, they're good. <laughs> you know, when Bruce, if you watch, obviously I've made them done ten million DVDs. I think it's on Vivo, which I've not got. I've seen it on YouTube, sorry. 2010, I think it's the Final Frontier tour. Eddie on that one is 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 the size of a house. It's <laughs> Eddie's got so big, it's amazing. Um, but you listen to Bruce's intro to Blood Brothers. It's so over the top. It's so ridiculous, you know. And he, really, Bruce is just repeating Steve Harris's thing. Really, and we don't even know who really believes it when he's saying it doesn't matter if you're black or white or you're, <laughs> what religion you are. You're all metal. We're blood brothers, and you, you you want to believe it? Although it's nonsense. <laughs> you want to believe it? Oh, the team. Uh, yeah, they're both five eggs for me. Jesus. Really? Yeah. Uh, I actually think that's four eggs for me. Mm. That's it, it's controversial. I thought I would like it um, a lot more than I mm. than I did on this. Because I had low expectations. I've have heard it before, but it was a long, yeah. long time ago, and I had quite low expectations. I remember the production being worse, and it sounds right. Actually. Yeah, I think what it is is I've listened to it quite a lot. Yeah. But having not listened to it for a long time, I, I assumed there was going to be lots of songs where I go, oh yeah, remember that? Yeah, that's brilliant, that is. I didn't get that, that on that many occasions, so I was, I was a little bit hmm, disappointed, <laughs> uh, strangely enough. I think it's also... I was quite young when I was into that. Yes, uh, and it is, it is for teenagers. Yeah, really. it's a, there's been a bit of a perspective change. I think there is still an element of rebellion in there it's a sort of it's a different type of rebellion it's not screw you all it's a more of i, th- I think it's an american thing you know their sort of um rebellion is a kind of a rebellion against people making them think i'm just gonna go to this concert and and chuck beer about and everything like that i'm not going to justify myself to, Self to anyone. Probably the fans at this point are complete lunatics. They they rip their shirts over and cut themselves with with glass. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, that's obviously not all Metallica fans. I mean, Metallica well, yeah, got such know, a wide wide yeah, following. It's, but it's, it's, well, mine is everybody, isn't it? Yeah. Um, everybody knows Metallica. All the time, mate. Apart from me, it's apparently. Uh, whereas I made it into more of a. I don't know what it is. I think you just heard them too late. I, I think maybe. Yeah, and I, yeah, it is weird that you know Maiden had their lull in the in the the nineties, which now is is how how did Maiden not be massive success successful? Yeah. They were playing halls. They played Wolverhampton Civic in ninety six. That's hard to believe. I didn't even go to see <laughs> actually. And of course, Metallica were the opposite. Well, metal was down. They were huge yeah. with shit albums. <laughs> but really, that's just the black album. It was just the the, the, the effect of the black album yeah. since a decade. And I think Gary Jink was a a masterpiece of management. Yeah. To produce, they didn't have to write any songs. Yeah. They just had to perform songs that they really liked. Their favorite songs. Well, yeah. and they and, that, and they pulled that off. I think. Yeah. I think that helped. Yeah. Uh, and in the end, you got a really good album out of that. Anyway, so yeah, he's four eggs. He's, what did I give it last week? Three eggs? Yes. I, 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 I'd sit down three eggs. Yeah, that's what I expected. Yeah. yeah. Well, I expected you to give rather than five. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it, uh, I suppose I'm projecting forward a little bit on my egging, which I probably shouldn't do, but there we go. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. I thought, uh, yeah, predictable. Yeah. Yeah. Right, anyway, we're late for a Skype call. So, yeah. see you next week. Have a good...